Hi everyone, uh, my talk is called How Deep Is Your Lock? And uh, just to be clear, this is not a talk about the Bee Gees. For anyone who doesn't get that reference, this intro is going to be really weird, but um, <laughs> this is probably not working on the video uh, as well, so this is going to be a weird pause, but you know, here we go. slightly changed that lyric, but um, I think that's what they were going for. So someone can perhaps shout out to me, what's the highest point in the UK? Ben Nevis. Right, raise your hands if you knew it was Ben Nevis. Right, that's a pretty good selection of hands there. Um, as, you, as you got it right there, Ben Nevis is the highest point in the UK. Uh, it's not only the highest point, but it's, it's, you, you see stories like this all the time, that they've added a centimetre to it, or you know, half a metre, maybe rounded up to a metre here, I think. Um, and we know a lot about it. People go and look at it a lot. So my next question to you is, what's the lowest point in the UK? Um, now, ignore the well, just a natural low. Um, can anyone know that? Mora. So Loch Mora in Scotland is the lowest point. Can I have a raise of hands for that? OK, there's six people there, I think. So that's good. That's what I wanted. Um, now, this is Loch Mora. Uh, you can see there that the shard fits into, into it there. It's just about 310 metres deep. Um, I think the Eiffel Tower pokes out the top. Uh, and it's not only the lowest point in the UK on land, but it's actually the lowest point in the whole continental shelf. So you can't go lower in, in the sea until you get out towards St Kilda. Um, and you can see there it's, uh, um, it's on the west coast of Scotland, and it's, it's actually got the shortest river, the River Mora, coming out there. Just You can see those nice white sandy beaches. Um, so it's a great place. Um, it's not the lowest point in the UK, though. That actually belongs to uh, Cleveland Potash Mine, I think. Um, and it's quite cool. It's got a dark matter research facility in it. And this place um, goes down to 1,100 metres, so it's uh, three and a half times deeper. Um, it's quite impressive to see what humans can do when they uh, want to extract some minerals and get paid for it. Um, but we'll move on. Does anyone know what this is? It is indeed the Loch Ness Monster. Um, now, this was not the Loch Ness Monster, but a lost Nessie prop. Um, now, this is not a big prop, and you could see from that um, uh, sonar image there that, that this is a lake that we know a lot about, but for the ridiculous reason that we think there's a monster in it. Um, it's a shame that we know very little about Loch Mora. Um, you know, we've got Ben Nevis, we, we look at a lot, so we've got Loch Ness. But the deepest point has barely been researched. And the people who did research it were Murray and Puller, who went out in 1902. Uh, they were surveying hundreds of lakes across Scotland, um, but Mora was the deepest one they found. And they went out with what, you know, it's a glorified bike, I guess. I don't know how popular the bike was in 1902, to be fair. But, um, so it might have been very modern equipment, but essentially this is just a big metal chain on a series of pulleys. Um, and when they got here, they realised they needed a bigger chain. Um, so it goes over 1,000 feet down. Um, now, I've actually got a copy here of... Um, this is uh, one of the first reports they did, I think, uh, for the Geographical Journal. Uh, so this has four lakes in it. It doesn't have Loch Morrow, unfortunately. Um, but you get these little sort of fold-out maps. Um, whoops. Uh, this is just sort of a general map of the area. This is Loch Catrin. Um, and then these amazing, um, if I can find them. So they've got geolo geological maps and um, maps of where the Ice Age was, this kind of thing. But then these enormous sort of fold-out maps. Now, you probably can't quite make out there, but on the blue bit, the lake, you can see perhaps some black dots from over there. And that's all of these points that you can see on there. So... I love these maps, and my mission here was to update them. Um, so, I put this slide in, if you want to have a quick read of that. This basically says that they weren't really supported by organisations and government, um, but they still wanted to do it, so they kind of went self-imposed 
made their own equipment. And I thought this was kind of like a really modern day sort of open source approach. At least I'm segueing that in. That's what I'm going for. Um, this is the full map of Loch Mora. Now, uh, actually, at my work, we do have a copy of this. Um, so we can digitize this, uh, take, just take photos of it, and then um, this is an image of it. Um, now, is it worth doing this? So with Loch Ness, they've, as, as I say, it's been surveyed a huge amount. They've found that these surveys were really accurate. Um, obviously, they're not going to always find the deepest point, but they measure across the whole surface of the lake. And most lakes, we have no bathymetry, no sonar, no nothing. Um, so this is not only the best thing we've got, but it's a good set of data. So what we want to do is we want to start digitizing the maps that we've got. So I've got this image, um, but I don't know where it is in space. So with QGIS GeoReferencer, it's a pretty simple job. I'm sure lots of you have done this, of just aligning points. And you don't have to do too many before you get a pretty good match. Now, there you can sort of see the, uh, the georeferenced uh, image. And we start then just logging these points. Um, you can see, this is a very small portion of the west end of the lock. You can see that there's a lot of points. Um, for Mora, there's 1,078 points. Now, um, me and uh, students uh, I had, Lauren Duval, uh, digitized four locks in Scotland. So this is just presenting you one. Um, Loch Ness has 3,500 points, I think. Um, now, I drilled it into her that she really has to make sure she saves her work, copies, these kind of things. After about 2,000 points, something went wrong, and she lost them all. So I think she's learned that lesson. <laughs> um, but it, it was learned the hard way. OK, so now we've got all the points. Um, it maybe took three or four hours, I would say, to digitize all of these. Um, now, what we need to do is we want to build a 3D surface of this. So we need to tell it that there's also a, a zero meter depth across all of the lake. Now, the way to do that, I took the lake outline, which I have as a shapefile, uh, took the, outline, the line of the outside, and then there's this tool called QChainage in QGIS. So you can just set your chain, essentially, for every 200 meters, every 100 meters, and it just defines points. And you can set them all to zero, or, or it will automatically be zero to start with. Uh, and then you can combine that layer with the layer of all of the depths. And you should have a good starting point to create a tin. So this is just using the interpolation plugin. Um, and this is uh, triangu triangular interpolation. So you're going to build this tin surface. So it's just interpolated across all of those points and predicted where, uh, what the depths are across that surface. Now you can, uh, can anyone make out? You can kind of see sort of triangle shapes building up in there. If you really zoom in, it's really obvious how it works. Um, but, yeah, if you, if you come out, it just kind of looks like a slightly smoother surface. Now, what I wanted to do was not just digitize the points or make this 3D surface, but create contours on that lake. Now, Murray and Puller did these by hand, and I'm sure that's not just a dying art, but probably mostly dyed. Um, and it would take a very keen eye to get that accurate. So I wanted to use technology to, make, to do that ourselves. And just for the sake of it, I decided to double the amount of contours uh, that they did. So how do we do that? So in QGIS, there's this contour plugin, and there's also a native contour um, function. So I had a look at this contour plugin, and it's really, really good if you want to very quickly create contours visually uh, interesting. They fill in the gaps with different colors. Um, and it, it makes these beautiful looking maps very quickly. It was sort of you know 10 seconds, and it was done. What it doesn't do very well is create the so you've got the lines of the contours and then the gaps in between. And it's, very, it's not easy to sort of export that data and play around with it in the way you would like. Um, so it's quick and visual, but not particularly good for analysis. Um, so you can just use the inbuilt contour tool in QGIS. Now, you can set your, um, the, depth, uh, sorry, the, the difference in depth between the contour lines quite easily. And you can just play around with what looks right. You can see on the right, top right there, that these contours come out and they don't really look like how you imagine contours. They're jagged and, and you know, liney. It's not really what we want. So um, we'll have a look at another step. Now, you also, when you look at these, you can see there's weird things going on in some places. Now, that's not just sort of the contour tool. That's something that's gone wrong. Uh, so you can see that point that's red, its value is 358 feet. And if you follow that line down, you can see the one that it's aiming to be, which was 658 feet. So that was just a typo. 
So actually, it's quite a good way to do this, to immediately see where you've gone wrong. If the error wasn't big, obviously, it wouldn't pick it up, but um, it's quite a handy way of doing it. Now, here, you can see um, the red line. Uh, you can see how it's going into the shore and coming out again and breaking all over the place. Now, this was the line I did without using the chainage, so without setting the zeros around the outside. So again, you can immediately see what a headache it would have been if you hadn't have done that. One other thing that happened is when you're georeferencing such a large water body, uh, your shoreline and the shoreline of the image aren't always going to be perfectly aligned. If they're misaligned in this way, uh, so you can see the red line was the original, you can see that some points with depths are outside of the lake, which is clearly going to cause errors. So you're going to get contours coming in to the outside of the lake and just disappearing. So quite easily in QGIS, you can cha change these points, bring them down. So the blue line was where it became. It, you know, obviously, that's not a perfect art, it's, but it's just a case of fixing that little error. So that's the same area. You can see that the green line was where these contours were breaking, and the pink line is where they've just been fixed by just m moving the outline of the lake. Now, we've got those jaggedy contours, but we want to... Well, this is line simplification. This is a really cool little tool here. Um, and you can just very quickly sort of simplify the U outline of the US. But if you think about it, we've got these jagged contours. We don't want to simplify them. We don't want to lose information. But we do want to sort of generalize the shape. So instead of a jagged edge, we've got a, a curve. So I said about trying to work out how to do that in QGIS. There's this plugin called the Generalizer plugin. Now, this has a load of algorithms in it, which essentially look... Most of them will look forward um, as it goes across the line and work out what the shape is, and then it will generalize it in, in a curve. Now, I think in this case, I ended up... You can see that there's loads of different versions of, of that algorithm, and this was really just a case of doing it by eye. Um, so I think I used this Boyle's forward-looking al algorithm with a 10-step look ahead. And that, just for this lake, ended up being roughly what looked correct. So we now have this lake... Um, we have this finished set of contours. Um, and you can see that they're, they're nicely curved. They're not, perhaps not perfect. Um, but with this amount of contours that we've added in, um, it's, it's a good result. And you can see that they nicely miss the shoreline, go around the islands and that kind of thing. So at this point, we've got an, a nice result to work with. Um, you can see a little bit more detail there. The, there's a lot of islands on Loch Mara, especially on the west side. And you can see that they've all been treated correctly. So now we want to display it. We want people to see it. And um, one way was to push this out to CartoDB. Again, this was a really simple way of getting the data online. It looks pretty nice. Um, this was probably a minute with the CartoDB plugin. Um, but again, you've got this problem of not having quite as much uh, control over it, the colors, the number of different colors across them, uh, and that kind of thing. So it wasn't quite what I wanted. And also, I wanted to interrogate that map as well. Um, so for me, I wanted to go down a, a better solution. And that was to style it all up myself and then set up GeoServer and push it out to GeoServer. Uh, so we've, we style it all up. So we've got the contours as white lines, and we've got the gaps between them as polygons. And we can style, style all of those up. Um, and then we've also got all the points that we can export as well. Now... Uh, I set up a little server using uh, this is Digital Ocean. I don't know if you're familiar with this website. Um, I'm not affiliated with it at all, but it was a really easy way to set up a server because you can save these snapshots. So I'm, I've never done this before. Um, my old colleague Stephen Bathgate and I did have a go at this, but I kind of had forgotten it all then, and I had to sort of try and work out how to do it. And as you go when you get success, you set different stages up. You can save your server as, a, as this droplet, and it means that when you then ruin it all again, because I kept doing that, you can come back where you were and, stand, and keep moving like that. Um, now, I don't know if you can share these, but that would be excellent if you could just perhaps download a fully you know, OSGeo stack. Um, so anyway, something to think about. Now, in GeoServer, once it's all set up, obviously it took a couple of hours, so it's maybe a couple of weeks. It, once it's all set up, you've got these... Um, <laughs> You can export your QGIS styles as the SLD files and then just import them into, Q, into the um, GeoServer styler there. Uh, so once, it's, once they're in there and it's all set up, this was actually quite a simple process. It's a bit fiddly, but it's, it's not complicated. 
So then um, I put these maps online. Now, uh, I hadn't actually planned for this. Um, let's get a browser going and see if this works. Uh, really? Okay, that's fine. Right, remember that website. <laughs> I'll tweet it out as well. You can see my Twitter handle at the end. Um, I do have some screenshots, so it's fine. Uh, sorry, wait, hang on. Let's go through. We don't want more BGs, do we? Okay. So, here we have uh, Lochmora. We've got all of the contours. We've got them styled how we like. Um, now, if you see at the top left, that's what's happened when I've clicked on the map. So I can get the contour depth, the um, closest point. We can add the points in the top right. We can fade the map in and out. We can change the backdrop map. We can look at the OS map to look at the contours they've used. Um, it's a really easy way to look through these lakes. Now, at the time of this screenshot, I've just done Mora. I've now got uh, Loch Ness, uh, Loch Lomond, and Loch Leven as well on there. Um, so it's really good to explore. One thing it, I can't quite get my head around is that when this gets hit with a lot of users, uh, I must, there must be a memory issue with GeoServer in some way that these just stop being displayed. And I have to, a quick Tomcat restart fixes it. Um, but there must be something I'm not quite doing right there. So uh, as soon as you start looking at this, these will disappear. I'll reset it on my phone, and they'll come back again. Um, but if anyone knows how to fix that in a sensible way, let me know. Now, the other great thing is you can use the um, QGIS to 3JS plugin, which we've seen in previous talks quite a lot. But this is quite a nice way to give the visuals of the 3D surface. You can move all of this around. Um, now, the good thing about this is that it looks great. The, hard, the slightly difficult thing is to get it looking quite nice. You've got to set various backgrounds. As to, to, you've got to set everything to black, essentially. And not only that, but this is built to show a sort of altitude. So you've got to invert all of the things. So essentially, the bottom of the lock here is naught, and everything else is an inversion. Um, but you can add a key and stuff, and it, it, play around with it. These don't break, so this is fine. You can look at these as much as you like. Um, so yeah, so that's bringing these maps up to date. Um, and not only bringing them up to date, but finding out new information. So just to finish, really, on this slide, um, you can see that the, using this technique, the volume of Mora, which used to be based on an average depth and the surface area, uh, this work has now shown that there's this huge additional volume, which is enough for the per personal use of everyone in Scotland for one and a half years. So just from a sort of natural capital point of view, it's amazing to think that we didn't know all of that water existed. So that's sort of some of the reason for doing this work. Um, and I'll finish there. Thank you very much. Okay.